Here we go. Go for it. What are we doing? We're recording. The continuation. Oh, oh, we're recording. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Hello and welcome to uh, the Honey Badger Pod Nerdcast. And this is me, and I would be Allison Teeman. Good, I remembered that. Um, and with me today to talk about nerdy stuff is uh, Rachel Edwards, uh, Hannah oh, Wallace, yeah. <laughs> Crystal uh, Crystal Garcia, and maybe Karen Strawn might pipe up if we don't chase her away with our excessive nerdiness. And certainly Susan is welcome to speak speak up too. Not no pressure. No pressure. I know. I know the nerdiness can be a little bit off putting, but I'm not but cool it's, enough to be a nerd. Oh, <laughs> oh it's so off putting. Oh my god! I think I need to have a shower. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. I've been nerd raped. You've been nerd raped. I have. I have. Oh, I, yes. You've been fucked yes. by the nerds. You. So, what do we want to start with? Uh, the the items on the agenda are Game of Thrones. Um. The last, the, the season finale of Archer, um, Adventure Time, and episode 110 of the comic book Invincible. And I also, actually, I also have a review in done by uh, Jessica, or Jess K. And uh, it's on the, the uh, a feminist contribution to n- nerd culture, as it were, which is a rape game called The Day the Laughter Stopped. And I'd also like to get that in on the discussion. So what, what would you guys like to do first? Don't all jump up at once. Uh, what about, we could do third one. <laughs> what about that comic? The, the, what, what was it? The one, one zero? Invincible, Invincible episode. That was intense. Yeah, that was intense. That was, that was pretty... Yeah, well, uh, just to give a uh, a summary for the audience, Invincible is basically about um, the son of a, a super superhuman alien, like incredibly strong alien. Uh, so he's half human, half alien. It's sort of like if Superman had a son and his adventures. And in uh, the comic issue one ten. He ended up being raped by another member of his of the alien species that contributed one half of his parentage, and um, who was a female. So it was a female and male rape, which was really unusual to see in any any kind of media. Not to mention something so graphic. And um, well, essentially, the story was he had just come back from some long drawn out journey where he had to fight some people and he come back to his pregnant fiance and she had thought he'd been dead for six months and she said that he, she couldn't handle this anymore so she had to leave and then when he's dealing with this and the fact that he's been betrayed by his best friend this other alien female who's stronger than him or as strong and has more combat training essentially rapes them and she does it because she's been given orders to produce a child by their by it's a little more it's really complicated but she essentially has to breed to perpetuate the race and she's been ordered to breed with a human but the only human that she will possibly deny to breed with is of course this this half human half alien and uh the rape is pretty graphic so go ahead what what do you guys want to say about it one one thing that I found interesting about that was that it wasn't portrayed as a joke or as lighthearted or as uh, some kind of sneaky way for him to get his rocks off. It was portrayed as a 100% raw, nasty, unpleasant violation uh, of him by this this woman who was physically stronger than him. And I, I know that in the uh, in the graphic art he fought back, right? He was he was hitting her back. He was he was trying to fight back. Uh, I don't know whether his his long journey left him depleted of strength or whatever, but or whether she was just naturally stronger, or better trained than him. But she overpowered him, and uh, and she, uh, if I remember right, she left him afterwards. Uh, she said, you know. Uh, something like, don't worry about it. Uh, it'll probably take a few times. I'll see you later or something like that. Oh, right. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. So she basically says it's going to happen again. Yeah. yeah. 
So, I mean, like, it was actually treated in an extremely serious context. Uh, and and that, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a very rare thing. Um, even, uh, you know, even if you look at the Don Draper uh, thing with Mad Men, uh, when he was, like, 13 years old and his fever broke and the, the woman who had been nursing him back to health popped his pop quote popped his cherry uh against his will and and there was i think only one feminist writer who came out and said wait a minute that that's actually like why are people titillated by this that that's actually rape um me i can understand why people are titillated by it because i can understand why people are titillated by any kind of forceful sex right i can understand why that titillation is there uh in either direction right but at the same time you sort of look at it if you put yourself in the position of the person who's being imposed upon the person who's being violated um the titillation has to take a secondary role uh to to your uh your empathy for that that person who's been victimized and with Mad Men, uh, there was there was almost no outcry, and with this, uh, because it seemed to be because I think maybe maybe because he was a grown man, and he was not uncertain about he was not uncertain or wavering or uh, you know sort of. Uh, Tentative about his resistance, uh, the way Don Draper's character uh, was in Mad Men. You know, no, 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 oh, 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 right? It, where it was, it was no all the way to the very finish, and it was no even after she was done with him, right? I think that, that that's a huge, huge statement. Yeah, it, it, I, I would agree, and I actually uh, I I understand what you're saying about the titillation and the erotic aspects. In fact, in, on Men's Rights Reddit, there was one one uh, commentator who said that they were off put. They found the um, they felt that the the scene was erotic, and well, the problem is that it would be really hard to depict a uh, sexual contact between, you know, super uh, attractive characters that wasn't erotic. Yeah. But the, the, the fact that there is that, that eroticism in it actually sort of makes it worse that this was a violation. And it, it, it does sort of tie into the reality that, that rape is forcing this kind of erotic intimacy against your will, right? So there's, there's that element. And I, I didn't find it that problematic. I thought it was actually more accurate. Yeah. Because a lot of that, the, the, the real suffering from rape is that ambiguity um, and um, that you're, you're engaging in something that's intimate and that can potentially be pleasurable at the same time as it's totally and utterly against your will. And to, to, to capture that I don't think is a problem, to capture the, the eroticism, but to make it subordinate to your ultimate um, sympathy for the character going through it, it I think that's, that's the sweet spot. Is that you, you can see, you can see the even just the horror of it by presenting that that by by um, by skating that line between eroticism and horror, right? You, that actually makes it even more horrifying. Well, I, I think I think too. You know, like uh, female pen fiction has a lot to teach us in this respect, as far as you know, romance fiction at least until the mid eighties. Uh, you know, a lot of the the romance novels out there, uh, you know, like there's there's a meme going on in romance today of the rapey hero, but um, there there is no raping hero in mainstream romance these days. Uh, that meme was driven underground in the mid '80s, um, but it existed until the mid '80s, uh, where um, uh, the hero of the story would literally rape the woman and not not rape the woman like in a romance written today for a mainstream publisher where where the the guidelines are she has to at least consent in her own head uh, before there's any penetration even if she, even if 
she is still physically resisting but consenting on the inside and he still believes himself a rapist it's still okay right um in the mid mid 80s to about the early 90s right you still had a genre you still had a, a segment of of mainstream romance novels where the hero actually raped the woman and actually traumatized her and actually brutally violated and betrayed her and left her traumatized, right? And then by the end of the novel, it was almost like she had, he had proved to her, if you had known what kind of great guy I was, you know, I am back then, you would have consented. And so it was almost like, it was almost like, you know, how you hear about false rape accusations being about uh, she decided in the morning that she regretted it, right? Well, these romance novels in the mid-80s were about she decided eight, nine months, ten months, a year even in the future that, oh, on the other hand, I don't regret it because he's proved that if I had known everything I was, I, I could know about him, I would have consented back then. So it's not just retroactive. Uh, it's not just a matter of, of with false rape accusations being a retroactive withdrawal of consent. There's also in the romance genre a retroactive attribute, attribute, adri- attribution of consent, right? Of yeah. saying, oh, yeah, no, I totally would have said yes if I'd known he, who he was, right? He's proved to me that I would have consented if I had known what I know now. And so it's all good, right? You know, like, it, it's just so much of sex and so much of our fantasies about sex are, are completely ambiguous, completely contextual, and completely subjective, and completely not prone to uh, objective definitions of anything. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of gray. And it, part, of, part of the problem with the feminist narrative is... They can't ex- exp- they can't accept the, the the sheer amount of gray in all of this. Yeah, and it's uh, it's it's um it's unfortunate that they've been been given the invested in the authority to talk about these issues because they in in creating this black and white they do a lot of harm I think and um, yeah but this is what this this. Invincibles episode 110, I think, was it definitely if you're listening, uh, go out and take a look at that one. That that episode, the, the story itself seems pretty solid. Uh, I really like that episode, of course, because it's addressing um, an issue that I feel is totally it's never addressed in fiction or anywhere. And it's it's interesting how it seems to be addressed more in science fiction and comics than anywhere, which in itself is sort of unfortunate because it makes it seem like. Uh, male uh, men being raped by women is something that doesn't happen in real life. It's which, fantastic, or it's science fictional. Yeah, which yeah. it does, and it, it happens at rates that are, are significantly higher that anyone in authority is willing to admit. But anyway, so go check that that particular episode out. It's really good. Um, I'm going to read uh, uh, Jessica's review of um or sorry Jess K's review of the day the laughter stopped which is essentially a game by a feminist <sighs> okay do you want to play a game game designer animator and writer Hannah's Floor has created a game reminiscent of the classic Choose Your Own Adventure books, except Floor's game is the worst Choose Your Own Adventure ever. <coughs> this game is nothing more than a narrative in which the player is giving options how to proceed, or should I say that the player is given the illusion of options and how to proceed? But we'll get to that. The narrative unfolds from the perspective of a 14-year-old girl in high school who has just come to the realization that an older boy in school, handsome and popular, has not only noticed her, but taken an interest in her. The game aspect is introduced when we are given options of how the protagonist may proceed at different junctures of her interaction with this boy. 
At every juncture, the player is given two choices, which essentially boil down to proceed or decline. However, it becomes quickly apparent that the narrative attached to the choice made by the player does not truly represent that choice. When the player makes the cho- conscious decision to proceed, they are met with a reluctant narrative. When the me- player makes the conscious decision to decline, the narrative essentially proceeds regardless. In this sense, the agenda is very clear that the author believes all roads lead to rape, regardless of whether the protagonist consciously consents or actively removes themselves from the situation, they will still get raped. What's that? Women are clearly objects that are only capable of being acted upon. Despite their disdain for the objectification of women, feminist rhetoric rhetoric continues to boil down to women being incapable of making rational, healthy, intelligent decisions for themselves. Instead, only being capable of reacting to actions performed upon them. Now, I know several of us actually played that game. Did you? Did any of you want to chime in on the experience of playing that game? It was insane. <laughs> yeah, it pretty no, much. Mean, is this the games that the feminists are going to create if they ever take over the game industry? I, I don't oh, know. God. Yeah. Like the, the worst role-playing rape games ever. <laughs> well, I, why not? It's what they do with everything else. I want to be a. I want to be a troll rogue who gets raped. <sighs> Is there any, is there any aspect of the game where where the girl is like, yeah, I'm I'm really not into this, and the guy says, I don't think you can walk away, and the girl does, and then the guy comes back nope. a week later and says, I really respect you. There is no aspect of the game no. where the girl shows any agency at all. No, I of mean any I actually, kind. Uh, I actually picked the, um, the the route where she just consistently ignored his letters, uh, ignored his advances, um, basically pulled away, and still I had no choice at the end because they disabled all of your other options. It's just like pull away and, uh, and had a couple options, but all of those buttons were disabled. You I, don't have a choice. You. you don't have right. any choice. Yeah. Well, and even if you if even if you go through and you take all the no options, the yeah. the game proceeds the same way as if you take all the yes options. It's just very subtly different in the text. And none of the no options are active no options. They're passive no options. She doesn't say, "I don't want to hold your hand." She just, you know, puts her hand in her pocket after a while. She doesn't tell him she doesn't want to kiss him. She just thinks about how much she doesn't like it when she's <laughs> kissing him. And and it's it's like that the whole time right through the 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 you know, description of the sex is is described in a way where she never says anything about, you know, don't do that. I don't want to do this. This isn't this isn't okay with me or anything like that. She just sits sits there and you know, she was uncomfortable going with him to be alone with him and went anyway, you know, had opportunities to say something to adults, never said anything to the adults. Maybe she had an experience like I had in junior high where all the adults overreacted. Who knows? But uh, it's just it's it's completely unlike um, a, a kid that age. I, I but, just I just I find that very very strange considering that uh, when I was fifteen, no no I think I was sixteen. I was fooling around. I was literally fooling around with a guy at a party out behind the house, right? Out in private. And at one point, the the girl who was hosting the party, her father came out and and shooed everyone out and said, get lost, and locked the place up, and my shoes were locked in there. and, And so I was literally without shoes. I was in my bare feet. And and he he said, I don't think you can just walk away. And I was like, you know what? I can. And I just walked away. And I walked home into my bare feet about, I don't know, eight, nine blocks, right? And then a week later, he, the next time we saw each other, he, and he was the guy that all the girls were trying to sleep with, right? He said, you know what? I, 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 I've never had a girl do that before. I, I actually really respect you for doing that. Hmm. Well, you know that um, they actually 
if women fight back and are, and I'm just talking about women who are raped. Of course, there's always men who are raped as well, and I'm not excluding them. I'm just focusing on women who are raped at the moment. They said they found that you know if women fight back and are actually assertive, they can get out of being raped. Oh, eighty percent. They can avoid it. You know, 80%. it's. 80% of the time, if, if a woman fights back, the rape isn't completed. Yeah. and But, of course, people say, well, then that's victim blaming. Well, are you going to put victim blaming over preventing a rape? Like, that's what I don't understand about these people. It's like, you can't victim blame, so you would rather people get raped. Yeah, yeah. No, what what gets me is like rain. This is this is where I got that statistic from. Was was rain the rape and abuse, uh, rape abuse and incest national network, right? And they they had an entire uh, sort of page on physical and verbal resistance, and saying you know like basically in in most cases there is a level of violence that a rapist will not escalate above right and if you at most police forces most most common wisdom says don't fight back because you'll be injured but isn't rape an injury Right. Well, and the narrative's a little um, iffy there because they say that rape is the worst thing that can happen to you. Well, so oh, even yeah. if you get injured, if yeah. rape is worse, being injured should not deter you from fighting back. Yeah, no, and, and basically if if you fight back, you might end up with some bruises and maybe a, a like a knocked out tooth, right? But you won't have been raped. Right. If I fight back, he's going to end up with bruises and a knocked out tooth. But yeah. you know, when I when I look at that situation with me when I was 16, right, in grade 10, at the end of grade 10, um, you know, I look at it and I think he was banking on me having no spine, right? He was banking on me just basically going along with, with what he said because he said it. That's what bullies do. Well, uh, but but it, forcible you know, rape is a is a form of extreme bullying. Bullies don't tend to say I respect you for rejecting me a week later, right? They they don't tend to do that. What you know what it was was like you know like literally if if I had been a typical woman right, a typical young woman, I would have felt coerced because if I didn't do it, he wouldn't like me. Okay. But or what he dared me, and, and I would have to live up to the dare. So, but the, to bring it back to the, to the, um, to the, to the thing, to the, uh, the, this actual rape game in which you can't make a choice to actually effectively change anything. Um, this is actually teaching women to be and girls to be even more rapeable. Yeah, it, it, it's like it's yeah, like teaching or, you not to have a spine, exactly. not, or to see to, as rape situations that are not rape. Yeah. yeah. Well, they, that's the other thing. I mean, the woman never, or the girl never clearly communicated what was that she was thinking or feeling, and this, I think, this ties into the into, and I'm going to bring in male victims now. Uh, it ties into some of the research. Um, don't quote me on this. I'm sure it exists, but I still cannot find it in any in any of my my uh, my repositories of research. But there, I am almost certain there was research that proves that. If you, if people who actually challenge male rape myths or the rape, the myth that men are always up for and always consenting, that actually correlates to lower rates of rape of women. So if you promote the cha- challenging male rape myths, if you promote challenging the idea that all, men are always consenting and always up for it, that actually reduces the rate of women, potentially. There's evidence to show that this is true. And it's because women, in it, when they know that, they will say no. They feel more empowered to say no um, when they don't think of men as being sex fiends that will just do it no matter what, right? Yeah, if they if they are able to view the the situation as a, a a mutual thing, if they're able to view sex as um, an involvement with each other with mutual desire, 
then it becomes easier to understand if you demonstrate that you're it's not mutual that you're averse that that would that would end the the uh, conflict that, yeah. that would you know that would put a crimp on his desire mm-hmm and in, in this this particular piece of I don't know what to call it. You want to call it a game? It's not a game. It's a piece of propaganda intended to take away women's agency and make them more rapeable. But Pretend more pick your path propaganda. Yeah, yeah but more useful for the I, feminist narrative. I think the most disturbing part of this whole game was the end, where they have option like tell tell your parents what happened, and you couldn't click that. It said. It's like, no, you're going to stay silent forever and, and just not tell anyone for years and years that this happened. I mean, she's passive throughout the whole thing. It's it's ridiculous. And, and then you can't play the game again either. You can't redo it or you can't... Uh, I mean, it'll say, no, this happened and you don't get a do-over. What? Yeah. I- well, you, you can, but you have to clear all your browser cache. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, it it, one, it it proves that teaching women not to be passive, or rather not teaching girls that when they grow up to be women, they have to be passive, is another thing that we need to do to prevent this type of misunderstanding. It'll prevent both rape and false accusations. Because I, I believe there are some false accusations that the uh, accuser believes 100%. And then uh, the reason the accusation happens is because she's raised to be this passive and to believe that this is how she should act. And then she goes through and, and participates in a sex act. And the guy has no idea that she's averse to it because she never voices it. And at the end of it, she feels raped because he didn't read her pretty little mind and realize that what was on her mind was completely different than the way she was behaving. That's a that's a lot of silence. Yeah, it is. Did we lose her? Oh, sorry. My my apologies. I wow. Um, <laughs> my apologies. That what I was. Were you muted? Say? Yeah. Were you I muted? Was, and then I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't any of you step up? Did you like? I was just. I was just about to say. <laughs> I was like, that's a lot of silence. I. <laughs> yeah, when I stopped, I thought, and nobody. Oh. Yeah. yeah, but it, it was I, like, I thought I was having a problem on my end. <laughs> I wasn't but sure. It was really weird that you guys didn't jump in because what was reading <laughs> my mind was was there some thought transference that was going through? Hey, we can't read your mind, Allison. Just like uh, not everyone can read, you know, subtle consent. Yeah. <laughs> Better not mind readers. <laughs> and that's what I was just talking about. Were you guys able to hear what I said? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But what I was saying when I was muted, um, and you guys were staying quiet for me to say it, <laughs> you couldn't hear me, which was which was remarkable and strange. Uh, what I was saying was that um, consent, like the, this this entire game, fetishes, fetishizes the idea that women are at, solely acted upon and defined by being victims. Not just fetishizes the fact that this exists, but it, it almost makes it a prerequisite for being female. And, and I wanted to then move on to, let's talk about Game of Thrones, because this is just disturbing shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, what are you people trying to say to women and, and, and promote as an attitude that women should take towards their own lives? Um, complete in, and utter fucking inability. Eh, whatever. And you... <laughs> Anyway, game. Of I see. I'm going to have to do that cake video I talked about in chat when we first discovered this. <laughs> it just it has to happen now. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I forgot about. I forgot to which... get the cake. <laughs> oh, what the was cake the video, in which someone feeds Hannah cake, and and she keeps. There eating will be it. a voiceover of my oh. thoughts regarding the cake. Oh I yeah, won't say yeah. A word. Yeah. As I'll just Hannah's keep eating. Nom cake. nom nom nom. <laughs> oh, this cake is horrible! I, I wish they would stop feeding me this cake. Om nom nom nom. Um, <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? Can't you see? I don't want any more cake. Om nom nom nom. <laughs> you see? Cake culture. Cake culture. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> okay. The cake Game is a lie, guys. Game of Thrones. Take it away, Crystal. I know you did the summary, so. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, a Song of Ice and Fire series is a fantasy story written by George R.R. R. Martin. Within it lies a world of dragons, kings, and queens, and the brutality of survival. Some of the most vibrant characters are born of this series. Hey, uh, I, I, hate to, I hate to break in, but well, you're breaking up very badly. You know what? I will find the um, summary and I'll read it myself. Okay. Okay. Let me see if I can find it. All right. Summary of... Oh, wait. This is not... This is George R. R. Martin. Oh, okay. A Song of Ice and Fire series is a fantasy story written by George R. R. Martin. Within it lies a world of dragons, kings, queens, and the brutality of survival. Some of the most vibrant characters are born of this series. Daenerys... Oh, my God. These names. Daenerys Targaryen. <laughs> Tar- Daenerys Targaryen. Calicia... Queen of Dothrak, a mother of uh, dragons. Queen of the Dothraki. Dothraki. <laughs> oh, God. And mother of dragons is hell on, bent on revenge and reclaiming the Iron Throne of Westeros. Tyrion, the powerful dra- dwarf of the Lannister family, is witty and knows how to manage his warped sister, Queen Cersei, and her brother, her twin brother, lover, Jaime. His mother died giving birth to him, something his father, Lord T- Tywin won't let him forget. Tyron is a brave fighter and seems to fear no one. Arya Stark, one of the princesses of Winterfall, wishes to be a warrior. She was kidnapped but escaped and now searches for her family and plots her revenge. And many more vibrant and vicious characters stir in the story, all caught in the War of Thrones. This epic story has been brought to life on the TV series Game of Thrones, named after the first of five books in Martin's series. Now in this series, there is the saying, which means all men must die. It is a saying repeated throughout the book. In High Valerian, it is Valer Morgulis. Uh, Jacqueline Gahar gives a coin to Arya Stark and tells her to use the words Valor Margolis if she wants to find him by handing him the coin to any man from Barvos and saying those words. Arya uses it to open the temple of the many-faced gods, and a slave says to Daenerys, and she replies, but we are not men. This campaign leaves New York streets and buses and trains with signs that say all men must die. This would never be acceptable if it were said all women must die. Okay, Crystal, are you are you back with us? Back from the dead. Yeah. yeah. So okay. speak to this. Uh, I apologize for mangling the names. No, you did good with the car. That was good. Okay. So you've been you've been essentially doing like some interventions where you changed all men must die to all men must be loved. But I know you guys wanted to talk more about the series itself in relationship to uh, men's rights issues, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, take it away. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, am I going first or are you going first or You can go ahead, Rachel. Okay. Well, actually the thing about the television series is it's gotten pretty rapey. I don't know what the hell's going on, but we do know that the relationship between Daenerys Targaryen in the first book series, um, well, where the first her first encounter with Khal Drogo becomes a rape, whereas in the book series it was yeah, it, it, not no, no, it, it wasn't yeah, and um, I, I don't understand what the hell's going on. Recently, uh, Cersei Lannister was raped by her brother Jamie, and um, right beside their son's corpse. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Did this happen in the book series? Because I have, I'm reading that book right now, so I, I will let you know. But I, I, I do not I mean, know. Jamie has been, you know, on the way towards, you know, really redeeming himself. And I'm like, oh, I really like Jamie. He's he's kicking ass and taking names and doing good things and and being a great guy. And I didn't expect to like him. And then suddenly he's a rapist. And I'm like, son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, I was really upset um, when they made um, Drogo rapist, because you know, like uh, Khaleesi's husband, a rapist, because he wasn't. I, in the book, first of all, in the book, she's much younger. She's like, I don't know, like 13, 14, whatever. But in the book, he he's very gentle, and he says to her specifically, I will not take you. You come to me when you're ready. You know, so he just leaves her be completely. She's like, okay. Okay, and then they have sex. But, in, you know, so when I saw the show, I thought that was, it didn't show really just how nurturing and caring and loving he was with why they did that. Someone told me it was, oh, maybe they're just trying to move the story along. I, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> that, that was 
is your bullshit. Job. I destroy. That's a stupid. That's a stupid excuse to destroy him. Okay. You know, I, I've actually yeah. seen this this problem of this instantaneous rapiness with male characters in other series as well. Like, um, I'm I was uh, and I still am big into anime, and there was this this movie that probably nobody here knows about called Wings of Hanonimes. And there's a scene where up to this this scene, and it's it's essentially about this really really odd alternative Earth with this very different culture and really weird technology actually getting into space. So it's all about their space um, exploration, and they they haven't actually gotten into space. They're trying to get into space, but the main character is an astronaut in this, and up to this point, he has been like the nicest, sort of innocuous, slightly goofy guy. And then he's with the main female character, and he just attempts to rape her. Like, and it's like a scene, like, what? Where the fuck did this come from? How does this make any logical sense with this person's character up to this point? Yeah. You know, he's alone with this girl, and suddenly the rape switch gets flicked? You know? Yeah. And it's yeah, well, like... Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, 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 sorry. If I remember, Melisandre was also a little bit rapey of that one guy. I think she she killed him afterwards too. Uh, but okay, I don't, for for those of you who don't know, Melisandre is the Red Woman, and she's um, working with Stannis Baratheon, who also has claim to the Iron Throne. But he's been completely pushed to the side by um, Joffrey Lannister, well Joffrey Baratheon, or whatever. But he, he's really a Lannister, let's be fucking honest. But anyway, um, she she's off, you know, ma- manipulating stuff and doing weird sex magic and killing people. And, and that's another thing, though. Um, the women in Game of Thrones are very real. There are, of course, yeah. the there are of course the ones who are really manipulative bitches. Then there are the ones who you know have good intentions but might not be as smart. And then there's the ones who are just really, really passive and don't do fucking anything. You know, it's <laughs> you know, I, I really like that about the series. They don't they don't you know step around the issue that there are these kinds of terrible women out there that will be out there behind the scenes pulling the strings. Yeah, yeah Cersei's a great example of that. Yes. <laughs> She's a disa- I mean, an evil, evil disaster, that woman. Uh, uh, yeah, I do think it's great to see, you know, female characters portrayed that way. Um, I mean, even in most movies, if you see women who are, are vicious or brutal, it's done in a way that's sexy. It's like, oh my god, I'm killing somebody, but my hair looks perfect, you know. So it's it's good to see these gritty, really intense, you know, fucked up female characters, because it, it brings a little, a little back, uh, what we're seeing out there as far as female oh, Chris, Crystal, you're breaking up very badly. Uh, Oh man! Uh, crap. Am I am I still bad? Yeah, it's it's gonna it's gonna stay that way. I'm afraid. Uh, what we can try to do is uh, maybe uh, maybe hang up and then call okay. call back. Okay. All right. I'll try that. Okay. Yeah, and we'll continue. Um, did you have anything more to say about the issue? The um, not the issue, but the the subject of Game of Thrones, Rachel? Oh gosh, <laughs> there's so much to say about Game of Thrones. But um, in terms of men's rights issues, um, I, I don't really see as much at the moment. But I know something is bound to come up soon. Well, you know what? <laughs> Let's, move Let's move on to a different. Well, I have a thought on this finale. actually. Okay. Okay. And that's it's. It, this is as a person who doesn't watch the show and hasn't read the series, but I just heard you guys discussing the fact that uh, men in the show are portrayed as rapey where they aren't necessarily in the series, and they're portrayed as abusive where they aren't necessarily in in the book series. Um, so where <clears throat> the makers of the show have inserted, I guess you would say, um, violent drama. And they've inserted it on on the male characters. Um, 
it, it really took me right back to where Karen was talking about how in the 80s, you know, and prior to the 80s, that, that erotica written for females contained an element of rape where the male character would the male hero would rape the female character and then over the course of the book he would win her over and and i'm kind of looking at this and suspecting that this is what they're trying to do they're writing the exact same kind of thing only in this instance it's it's um not necessarily erotica it's mainstream but they're targeting a female audience for whom this is a type of fantasy that this is their, their they they want this image of of men, and and that's what they're giving them. I, I think that one of the things is that they're they're trying to make these women be really sympathetic characters and feel as a they're trying to uh, insert things obstacles for them to overcome that just do not really exist within the book series within the source material. Make the female a sympathetic character by portraying her as a, a victim. Yeah, because is a way of softening her up. Yeah, because to be honest, Cersei is a cold-hearted bitch, and there's really no excuse for it. She gives a little bit of it where she says that when she was married to, um, gosh, when she was married to the king um, uh, or the man, yeah, Robert Baratheon, when she when she became. <laughs> When she was married to him, she was really, really in love with him, and that then he went and you know got drunk and hoarded up, and then she just really got upset about the whole thing and just went back to incest with her brother. And yeah, I mean, but that's bullshit. Wait, wait, wait. So she's blaming no. her bitchiness on a man's behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and it wasn't part of the books. It really wasn't. Um, the, in the books, uh, Jamie and Cersei. Uh, had a relationship all the way through. She was cuckolding yeah, yeah. Robert Baratheon. Uh, she she knew she was doing it while she was doing it. Um, you know, like literally, uh, she tortured Tyrion, her her dwarf brother, in his crib, in his cradle. Right? She tortured him. She pinched his genitals and and did all kinds of nasty things to him. Right? I'm gonna ruin the show for you guys. Yeah, you know, like They're watching the feminized version. Yeah, yeah. They're but, having but, to make these women. They're having to portray these women as having the illusion of agency instead of having agency. Yeah, well, I mean, like, like y- you look at you look at the in the books. At one point, she has she has a torturer. She hires a torturer to torture somebody and like and do all kinds of really horrible things to him, like cut his nipples off and all kinds of fucked up shit like that. Mm-hmm. Right? And and she she goes down there and visits every day and, and she's like, You're not gonna talk yet? Okay, goodbye. You know, have fun for the next twenty four hours. Right? Like she's she is not a fucking decent person. She's not a person who was spurned or, you know, who who turned into a bad person because she was cheated on Right by her husband, whom she yeah. loved. She she had no in the books. She had no love for Robert. Yeah. Right. She had no love for him at all. And but in the movie, they've inserted it. Yeah. They have, of course, they have because they have to give her an excuse. Yeah, yeah it's, it's to, always well, yeah. They make they make it. It's always a man's fault. It's always something that a guy did, and that's why she's terrible. And that's bullshit. Yeah, the understand it all is still a difference. man's fault. The difference between those those books and the television series is that the television series is for a mainstream audience. There will be people watching this, hordes and hordes of people watching this, who've never even touched the books, probably never even walked into a bookstore, because they're not the reading type of nerds. Yeah. And and so, you and know, you I, have... I mean, but you have that feminized version happening because that is what Hollywood, that's what feminist Hollywood has the public accustomed to. Okay, but you could you could argue. You could argue, okay, that okay, maybe the TV producers, right? They they figured, oh well, you know, because in the books there there's some ambiguity, like her and her brother Jamie, right? Seem to be complete fucking sociopaths, right? They mm-hmm. seem to be completely freaking psycho. 
um, especially since they're fucking each other and passing off their child as the child of, of Cersei's husband, right? Okay, so, I mean, like, y- you look at that and you think, okay, well, maybe their upbringing, maybe their parentage, right? But when you go further in the books, right, you determine, you, you actually learn that Jamie Lannister, right, he, he lives by a code. The code is we always repay our debts, right? We always live by our honor. Um, and, you know, in order to have the son and the daughter, who are twins, I think they were twins, uh, turn out so very different, where, you know, maybe they're they're raised by the same abusive parents, right? But she turns out to be a complete manipulative, deceitful, horrible, horrible, skanky hoe, right? And he turns out to be, you know, a character that can redeem himself in the eyes of the reader, right? Mm-hmm. Is actually capable of, you know, with his interactions with Brienne, right? Uh, that that he can he can redeem himself once he lost his hand, you know, like oh my god, you know, and he's saved by Brienne, and Lannisters always repay their debts, and all of this other stuff, right? That he's he's still, even if he was abused, even if he was like horribly, you know, pulled into some kind of horrible bullshit by his sister, that that he could retain some sense of honor in the name of his family, right? You have to give some kind of extra excuse to Cersei. You have to give some kind of extra, you know, uh, just just vindication yeah. and, and all of this other stuff, an excuse, a, a reason, an extra reason, right? That didn't it, it, that didn't exist in the books. Right. No. Oh, she yeah. loved Robert, and he he slept around on her. Right. No, no. That, that didn't happen in the books. Right. She was just fucked up. Maybe she was more fucked up than her brother. Maybe it was. Maybe it was innate. Maybe it was genetic. Maybe it was an accident of birth. Right. Maybe she was just a stone cold sadist. <laughs> maybe maybe yeah. it was female nature. Who the fuck knows, right? But for whatever reason, you had these twins. They were born into the same situation. He wound up being able to redeem himself, and she didn't. And the books flatly, honestly portrayed that. And the TV series is trying to make excuses for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because yeah. Female- you can't have a woman who is okay. inherently evil. Yeah, exactly. There can't be a female criminal unless it's a man's fault. Yep. Uh, you know what? If women can't have negative agency, they can't have positive agency. And I guess people don't realize that. But let's exactly. move on to something that I actually know something about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Archer finale. <laughs> No, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if any of you guys actually watch Archer. I, do. I no, I've never seen it. I don't, I don't know. I've seen like three episodes. Yeah, <gasps> it's a, it's essentially sort of like if Get Smart was uh, in booze. Sorry, if Get Smart was doused in booze and sex. If yes. Guess had more drug use. <laughs> yeah. When I have time to actually sit and watch something, that's probably going to be the first thing I'm going to catch up on. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it, it is. It is. It is sort of. It, it's. It's got some really great dialogue. I'll yeah. put it that way. Essentially, the premise is that there's this super spy who is part of an a, a spy agency headed by his mother, who's an alcoholic. And um, do you call Mallory a slut? Can you call Ma- Mallory a slut? Yes, Mallory. you can. Yeah. <laughs> Mallory's a slut. Archer is also a slut. Esther. Archer is also a slut. In fact, actually, and who is an alcoholic? Who isn't a slut? Who isn't a slut and who isn't an alcoholic in that spy agency? Exactly. Oh, not, me. not me. Oh, wait. I didn't just say I was a member of ISIS. Wait, what about, what about yeah. Krieger? Okay, well, Krieger, but... does it... <laughs> Oh, but Krieger is just fucked <laughs> up. Yeah, yeah he's, 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 he's just impossible to categorize. Um, maybe it has something, has something to do with like radiation and stuff. Does Krieger drink? I don't think I've ever seen him drink. 
Does Krieger have crab claws? I think he does. No, crab but claws? He, no, but he does have I like probably know, a, yeah, I, he does have a collection of a uh, tentacle porn. Yeah, tentacle. no. Yeah. I I feel like he's he's just kind of like one of these completely detached from reality and any kind of emotionality and just like he he's like a Joseph Mengele. Mm. That that's what Krieger is. Well, I don't know. Sometimes he has more yeah. he, he almost relate to him more than the others. Yeah. Well I think what sometimes does that say about us? Joseph yeah. <laughs> So. But anyway, so the the spy agency has uh, okay main character Archer, who's like a super spy, who's indescribable. He's basically a valley girl crossed with James <laughs> Bond, who really, really, really likes cats and alcohol and yeah. sex and yeah. alcohol and sex. Um, I mean, come on! I mean, the, in the the finale, he's like, or no, the second to last episode, it's like giggling about the tiger. <laughs> <laughs> and he's so really he's got, afraid of alligators. And he's really afraid of alligators, but he never really so acts afraid of alligators. Because <laughs> I mean, you know, those alligators were like eating those people, and he was just still not freaking out to the point where he couldn't fight back against them. Yeah. Well, you know, like I, I, I think the last Archer episode I watched was about a month ago. So on Netflix. Netflix, on Netflix. So, so I'm probably not up to speed. But, but I, that's, a month ago would have been Terry. Did you watch the the episode in which the alligators ate the? Uh, no, no. The corrupt- I don't remember any alligators. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, then you you went before, but that was a pretty amazing episode because how did how did Ray actually pretend to be crippled while alligators were eating dead bodies right next to him? <laughs> like that is dedication. <laughs> I, I don't know whether that's pretending to be crippled uh, more. Like uh, maybe it was just like petrified with fear. Um, I, I don't know. I think you would think that he would get up and just scare her. Hey, well, maybe you're right. Maybe it could be petrified with fear. I was thinking it was dedication to to just pissing off Archer. You know what? This this is really gone. For, yeah, people probably don't even know what the hell we're talking about if they've never seen the show. Phrasing. I can imagine Crystal and Hannah scratching their heads back there. In They're shape. so confused. Yeah. I'm definitely lost. Yeah, I don't know the crippled character. Oh no, my god, no, what are you guys doing if you're not watching Archer? What the hell? Like, <laughs> I, I work full time. I have sales. I even freaking have cable TV. You yeah, like have, you haven't watched oh, this? It's, yeah, it's an internet show. You, no, I, yeah, I watch it online. Oh, yeah. wait, is it on TV? I don't oh, know. I don't have yes, cable Yes, here. it is. It's on yeah. FX, I believe. Uh, okay, yeah. so the final show, the final episode or of the season, um... Oh, oh God! So much happens. So uh, much. Yeah, it's way, almost too but, much. So I, spoilers. Okay, spoilers. Spoilers. Um, I think we should have said that before because we've yeah, been giving out spoilers all along. But um, so uh, Krieger is with his Krieger clones because uh, he, he's discovered four more of himself of clones of Hitler. And um, his Krieger clones are arming a missile with nerve gas to an unspecified to to go to an unspecified location, and he decides to fight back and attempt to unarm it. Um, and meanwhile, um, something something CIA drug running. Uh, they're going to they've called in an invasion on the country, the South American country that they're a part of, and, and, uh, and Christian Slater. <laughs> I, I watch this damn show and I don't fucking understand it. Um, does maybe you could help me out, Rachel? He, yeah, he, um, Christian Slater. I think uh, I, I don't know. I think they were. I, I'm confused. I mean, I know that they were trying to fund the rebellion, but they were the rebellion, and they planned the whole um, selling of drugs to try and fund the rebellion the entire time, and. Archer had no fucking clue that that's where they got all the cocaine, and now everybody is collectively confused. 
<laughs> because now we've brought cocaine, so now there's hookers and blow in the equation, and now everybody is just scratching their heads. Okay, no, but okay. But the thing is that you know, and the the problem is that me and Rachel have watched to the end, and we don't know what the fuck is going on either. So it's almost impossible for us to explain. <laughs> oh, okay, it. Lana is preggers. Lana is preggers, and she's uh, Lana. Okay. Okay. As somebody Lana is, Lana is like the main female character. Yeah, and well, um, she that from, I know. She sort of has an off and on again relationship with Archer. She's sort of like those stereotypical um, black exploitation characters of the seventies. Yeah. But- yeah, it must have been on again nice. at some point if she's pregnant. Well, oh. yeah, but that's a big sport, I think right? I think she <laughs> said she was pregnant with with what's his name, the dude. Uh, uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't Cyril. No, it wasn't. It wasn't Cyril. Wheelchair, but the other dude. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Cyril Figgis. Cyril. Or? No, no, it wasn't. It's not Cyril. It's to be it's Cyril. Not Cyril. Cyril. No, it's not Cyril's baby. She said she said that she got a sperm donor or donation kind of thing, sperm bank. But she didn't yeah. say. But she never said uh, like where. Yeah, and or then, where. And then we get to the end, and they're in an p- airplane after all this shit. And spoiler: guess who's the dad? <laughs> Archer. <laughs> and well, what happened was he had uh, he had frozen some of his sperm for when he had breast cancer. And okay. um, yeah, and then she she got the sperm and impregnated herself, which is sort of like she many many shares. Him. Yeah, so it's sort she of many shades him. of really shitty. Kind of rapey. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? You know what? I all the roads lead back to rape. <laughs> you know? Jeez. You know what I want to ask you, geek ladies? You geek ladies? You nerd ladies? Okay, but how many of you have watched Frisky Dingo? I've watched some of it. It's I'm, also incomprehensible. I, I should, though. That, that was the precursor to Archer. That was the producers, the animators involved in Archer. It was an excellent series. Mm-hmm. It was a beautiful series. Incomprehensible series. It was totally comprehensible. This is why I just need time to sit and watch something. And most most people have actually been upset with this season. How the hell was that comprehensible? Well, maybe I need to watch more of it, but it, it never made sense to me. So the evil the evil dude who who looks like a freaking gigantic dude in in a white lace bodysuit, right? Except for he's not wearing any clothes. What? Right? He has a skull face. Yeah. yeah, and he has a skull face. He has a son. Who does nothing but mumble, right? Mumble and be uh, antagonistic and and oh, un- unfeasible. Oh, Crystal, you're still breaking up. Ah, oh, poop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, does does Frisky Dingo like um? And I got I watched a few episodes and I thought it was interesting. It just I could never understand it. Oh, like, watch it from the beginning. Watch it all the way to the end. It's a very good series. It, it's a precursor. It's it's kind of like the Doctor Random of Cam to Yule, mm-hmm. right? So it's, it's mm-hmm. sort of the random, all the way out there, crazy, crazy, right? Mm-hmm. To the more cohesive social commentary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although I don't know if well, but let's go back to to Lana sperm jacking. What do you guys think? Yeah. Like, um, I don't know if Archer would be completely upset with that sort of thing, but I don't know. It's hard to say. Yeah, I think I'm he'd be sorry. fine with it if he wasn't forced to pay for it. Yeah. 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 She's well, like, "This is your daughter." Um. Yeah. <laughs> It's sort of a shitty thing to do, though. I mean, in general. Yeah, it is. It, it, it is terrible, but then again, Archer has impregnated many a woman by accident. It doesn't, it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right. It just, he's really irresponsible across the board. And there, there's, there's several times that he could have impregnated Lana just by, you know, normal oh, intercourse. I always hate the phrase accidental pregnancy. I I always sit there and wonder, you know, what happened? Did she fall on his dick and then she couldn't get back up? (laughs) 
It's <laughs> <laughs> like a skating. Uh, oh, geez, I'm still having trouble getting back up. Let me try again. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> she couldn't get traction. <laughs> there was no traction to be had. So all she did was she, even, she even had sex with him um, when he had cancer, didn't she? No, they, she said that she almost had sex with him. Oh, let's see. Super lube. Super. <laughs> all I know is there is such a thing as an accidental pregnancy, but there is no such thing as an accidental motherhood. Yeah. That's, what yeah, happens, yeah. that's what happens when you use a Teflon rubber. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's what happens when you use a sponge in withdrawal. Yeah. It's uh, it, it's hard to 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 try to shoehorn the Archer cast into any sort of morality. Yeah, because they're all There's depraved. No There's yeah, none, they're, none, no morality, none. They're Archer, depraved, all of them. Immorality. <laughs> it's consistency, so, but it's not morality. No. Yeah, it's it's a, it's it's a bizarre congeniality. Shall we talk about Adventure Time another time? Because yes. Oh no, another time. Oh, okay. All right, we'll talk about Adventure Time. Okay, it's it's gonna be brief because I'm probably the only person here who watches the show, and (laughs) I've I've seen it. I've got my son watches it, so I've got a I've got a little bit. I've actually got a thing I've written here. Adventure Time is one of the few shows on television with a positive portrayal of male friendships and relationships. So it was a massive disappointment when Finn's biological father turned out to be a stereotypical deadbeat dad. This is not the first time that a character on the show has been distant from their father. When Marceline the Vampire Queen was forced to see her estranged father, the two managed to reconcile. However, in however in this episode, Finn's father was revealed to have been trapped in an interdimensional prison. He was a criminal that cared little uh, that cared little for Finn's existence and left him to die. While I disagree with this particular uh, the way that this particular episode went, I have not lost faith in the series. Jake the dog consistently fills a fatherly sort of role for Finn, and this is the first time a father character has been outright terrible instead of merely misguided. Though there is still time for things to be settled, and even if Finn's dad is never seen again, we know that Finn will be better for this experience. Because one of the themes in the show is not that fathers are not needed, but that positive father figures can come from anywhere and change our lives for the better. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, that, go on. that's actually uh, something that I've I've thought about in a lot of fiction too. Um, how relationships between men are portrayed and they're often like really poorly Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. to use an example is is a, a comic book that I probably nobody here has read but it's called Finder and the only relationships between men that are portrayed in Finder are either uh, aggressively violent, so these are people that the main male character wants to kill, or they want to kill him, um, or antagonistic, or in one case, it's the the gay male friend of the main character whose only real existence is to is to sort of futilely or impotently hit on the main char- male character to prove his attractiveness and be spurned, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and it, it just annoys me how often in fiction male relationships seem to go a- along that route of just being um, either violent or aggressive or confrontational or, you know, combative. And then there's, there's, this, there's almost like a a bit of a taboo towards male friendship. Yeah, I've actually seen that, and oftentimes uh, when you see that in popular media these days, they'll actually try and downplay it by making fun of it a little bit and calling it a bromance and things like that. And and really, when you see the relationship dynamic between Finn and Jake, they, they have their ups and their downs, but they always help each other. And it's, it's really great to see that on television, because you often don't see those kinds of relationships there anymore. Uh, he often, yeah, Jake the dog often gives out different pearls of wisdom as they're going, and he's he's not perfect himself, but he often, it, it never comes off as preachy, and you always understand that they had a great uh, set of parents growing up, 
and um, it, and there really aren't very many just outright evil characters in Adventure Time. There are some, but even Ice King, who kidnaps women, there's a reason for it because he went insane because of the crown that while while it keeps him alive, it also completely went uh, made him go crazy. And he once he was once this uh, scientist that actually helped to raise Marceline from a child when she was just um, abandoned out in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And um, he was a great father figure for her, and it's kind of a tragic relationship between the two of them. Because, uh, you know, there are windows of time where she'll go back and she'll remember how things were um, at, that, at that particular time and how she had to slowly but surely lose him mm-hmm. to the madness. And it's just kind of sad. It really is. And, and these kinds of relationships are important to be on television, to, to really see that, even if it is a little bit sad. And it's important that the subject matter is really dealt with with the way that ha- it has been executed very well and handled, um, you know, <laughs> in a positive way. Uh, even even though in that last episode, Finn lost his arm, and he was he was pretty sad about. He seemed um, pretty upset, but he was more upset that he just lost his dad. But you know, Jake said like, "It's okay, man. Things will be okay," mm-hmm. and. It, and you knew things were going to be okay even after that. I mean, I actually heard that a lot of children had some problems and they were really disturbed by what happened because he wasn't just finding out that his dad really didn't care about him. He was also fighting the lich in the middle of it and he was actually forced to choose between fighting the lich and going after his dad and he chose to go after his dad and while he was trying to hold on to the vehicle that his father was leaving on um, Jake was holding on to the other end and one of them gave, and that's how he lost his arm. Mm-hmm. It's it's really just heartbreaking, heart wrenching stuff. But I know things are going to be okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that sounds like it's really quite the intense show. Um, not that? always. Actually, a lot of times it gets very very silly. This was just one of those one of the um, few plot heavy episodes they stick on the end. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they often have a couple episodes that really establish a lot, but it's usually the ending episodes and the beginning episodes of each season. Mm-hmm. Okay, so is it like, uh, is there a place where you could go to get, to take a look at this series? Uh, well, it plays on Cartoon Network, but you could also view it on various places online, if you know what I mean. Yeah, we know what you mean. Okay. All right. Wait, well, wait, nudge, nudge. <laughs> 